Good morning. It is good to see each of you this morning. We will be in 2 Samuel 11. It was read for us. Uh, Got to tell you, it's, it's good to see you because I hadn't really expected to be here this morning. Uh, I thought I'd be in Tokyo on the U.S. swim team, but that's uh, not a joke. Um, I'm not sure why that didn't pan out, but uh, anyway, it is seriously good to uh, be with you. It's beautiful outside. I'm going to be a scorcher today, but uh, thank the good Lord for air conditioning. Uh, uh, several years ago, probably eight, nine years ago, I baptized a young mother, young lady who was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And boy, the, the, it was, I think, the saddest case I've ever seen in my life. This girl would get about a week or so of sobriety, maybe two weeks. Then she would relapse go further down that path of drugs and alcohol, string together a few more days of sobriety, and the cycle would repeat itself. She had a young son who was Will's age, our younger son, and he so desperately wanted to be friends with Will, but, you know, we had, Tammy and I had to walk that tightrope between letting him be friends with Will and this boy who had been exposed to so much who wasn't a very good influence. He had to be careful. This girl's mother would come to my office ask for advice. She, the girl was renting from her mother. I say renting. She hadn't paid rent in several months. She did not take care of her son, could not keep a job. She was draining her mother's checking account, and her mother was at the end of a rope. And it was very obvious. This girl's life was going to end in disaster. It was already a train wreck, and, and it was going to end in disaster unless she got help. Well, disaster came when she rolled her car over an embankment, became a almost comatose, almost a vegetable. And I, I, I hate to use that word, but she barely knows she's in this world. She has become a bigger burden to her mother. Her son has no real mother. It is such a sad, sad case. Her sin, her refusal to get help has affected so many lives. You see that all the time. You flip on the news and you see that someone has been murdered. Or there's a road rage incident where some parent mistreats a child. But look, it hits closer to home, doesn't it? Maybe some of you grew up with an addict as a parent. Someone who cared only about him or herself and didn't give you the time of day. Maybe you married your true love only to have him or her break those sacred vows. Maybe you live with a spouse who hurts you constantly with sin. Maybe you have a child who has hurt you to the core because of sin. The case of David and Bathsheba. 
It's not simply a case of a king who sees a young woman bathing, a beautiful woman bathing, calls her to himself and conceives a child. That, that's not the whole story. The whole story is that David destroyed lives with his sin. He hurt so many people. He hurt, destroyed lives. Think of all the people affected by David's sin. You've got Bathsheba. Yeah, let's be honest. She might have, I don't know for a fact, but she might have bathed when and where she did to get the king's attention. She may have been wanting to lie with the king, but she had no idea where everything would lead if that were her intention. You think of Uriah. His wife was violated. He lost his life. His life was not only turned upside down, it was over and ended. The child conceived through that adultery. The child died as punishment for what David had, di had done. A Hothbanel, who was Bathsheba's grandfather, he was a close advisor to King David, and he took part in Absalom's rebellion. It's not a leap to think that Ahithophel, I'll try to say his name, had this grudge against the king and he held this grudge and then he took part in that rebellion. The entire nation of Israel. Because David had killed Uriah the Hittite, God promised sword would never depart from David's house. So civil war, rebellion, result of David's sin. David turned the entire people of God upside down because of his sin. Sword, civil war, rebellion, punishment for what David did with Bathsheba and Uriah. And brothers and sisters, we need to think about David. Bathsheba, Uriah, the nation of Israel, because we need to get this lesson through our thick skulls. Your sin affects others. Your sin affects others. What you do is not something that just harms you. Your sin is not a private affair. Yeah, it might be secret. David was able to hide his sin for at least nine months. Then Nathan came to him and told him the parable, said, you are the man, and gave him the punishment from God. But during the time of the adultery, until the child is about to be born, David's able to cover up his sin and keep it secret. But even then, David's sin had affected others. And I want you to understand this morning that your sin affects others. Your sin it doesn't just hurt you. It hurts your family. It hurts the church. It hurts your neighbors. 
your sin affects others. Let's go to 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 15. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, Chad mentioned the idle hands and David should have gone with them. Sometimes, sometimes, when kings besieged a city, the king would stay behind and then he'd join the army as the war progressed. But even in this narrative, you see the war is progressing. The David's in Jerusalem. You know, if he had gone with his army, all this mess would have been avoided. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. He saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. She wasn't just pretty. She was like Tammy. She was very beautiful. I'm trying to score some points, by the way. She was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. Now, it's very likely that David knew who Bathsheba was. It's really impossible that the king did not know her. Jerusalem at this time is only about 10 acres. Most people who lived there were involved in administration, involved in the government. Uriah was one of David's mighty men. Bathsheba's father was one of David's mighty men. We've already mentioned her grandfather was one of his closest advisors. It's almost impossible to think that David did not know Bathsheba. And so... The idea of inquiring about her really carries the nuance of let's find out how she's doing. Let's go call on her. Let's ask about her. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of the lion, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Uh, the mention of purifying herself from her uncleanness is important. The point is that Uriah could not physically be the father of the child. She's cleansing herself of her monthly uncleanness. And thus, it's obvious who the child's father is. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. And she sent and told David, I am pregnant. David has a problem. This woman with whom he has lain, is now pregnant. He's got to do something about it. And like any good politician, uh, he starts a cover-up. Verse 6, So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When, da when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Be with your wife is what that means. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told Uriah, when they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, 
David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Should I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. David still trying to get Uriah to go home. In the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord. He did not go down to his house. There are two possible reasons David wants Uriah to go be with Bathsheba. Soldiers had to be abstinent while they're going to war. Ritual purity, you read through some of the old law. And so... David might have been trying to get Uriah to go home, be with Bathsheba, so that he can say, treason, and have Uriah killed, and then take Bathsheba, marry her, and have the child. It's also possible that David just wants Uriah to go home, be with Bathsheba, so that Uriah and everybody else thinks that's his baby. And nobody is none the wiser. For whatever reason, David's involved in cover-up. That's obvious. Uriah, go, go home, be with Bathsheba. Let's not let anybody know what's taking place. But Uriah refuses to do that. Uriah understands the need for abstinence under the law when he's at war, when he's on duty as a soldier. And so he won't go into Bathsheba. Think about that. Uriah is a Hittite. Did you hear that? Uriah is a Hittite. He's not an Israelite. And yet, his actions here are more godly, more righteous than the king of God's people. Here is the king, the leader of the people of God who has sinned. He calls for one of his mighty men who is not part of the covenant. He may have been a proselyte, I, I, I don't know. But he's not a child of Abraham. He is not part of the covenant. And yet his actions are right. And the man after God's own heart, his actions are wrong. Uriah, although he likely doesn't know what's happening, offers a very stinging rebuke the king. David still has his problem. In verse 14, he begins to take care of it again. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Is that not amazing? I think, honestly, that says something about the character of Uriah that the king could give him a letter, his death sentence, and Uriah would not open it. Uriah wouldn't check to see what's in it. But rather he follows the king's instructions and takes his death sentence from the king to Joab, the commander of the army. In the letter, verse 15, David wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. 
David is going to take care of his problem. David's going to cover up his sin. It's going to remain secret. Nobody's going to know what David has done with Bathsheba. He's going to have Uriah killed. He's going to marry Bathsheba. He's going to raise that child. And nobody is going to know. Nobody's going to be hurt. It's going to be a secret sin. We think that way sometimes. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to be hurt. This one time's not going to matter. David likely thought that. Uriah's life was changed forever. Bathsheba's life was changed forever. The history of Israel was changed forever. Think about that. The history of the people of God was changed, changed forever by David's sin with Bathsheba and what he did to Uriah. The sword shall not depart from your house. And you know that it did not. And I'm here to tell you, Scripture is here to tell you, God Himself is here to tell you, your sin affects others. Your sin affects others. So how should you live? What should you change this week because your sin affects others? How should you live when you go to the office, when you're at home watching TV, when you're doing whatever? How should you live? Number one, you need to survey your sin. You need to take a very careful look at the sin in your life. It is no fun to do a self-examination. It is no fun to take a look at your character defects. To take a look at your moral failings. But let me tell you something. You need to survey your sin. You need to take a careful look at how your sin is affecting others and ask yourself this question. How is my sin affecting others? You need to think about that seriously. Not something just to brush off. Not just something that sounds good and give no more thought to, but you need to think seriously. How does my sin affect others? How is your sin affecting your spouse? How does your sin influence your children? How does your sin dim your light at the altar? How does your sin bring reproach upon the church to your neighbor? How does your sin affect others? All sin affects other people. Every single one affects others. Eve took of the fruit in the garden and plunged the entire world into sin, disease, sickness, death. Her sin 
Adam's sin as well changed the history of mankind between then and the return of the Lord Jesus. That one sin, one sin affected everyone else who was to come. Korah's rebellion, number 16.32, the earth swallowed up Korah, his cohorts, and their families. Their families died because of what Korah and his ilk did. It affected the family. They died. Because of that sin. Barnabas. Barnabas, son of encouragement, was carried away by Peter and the rest of the Jews' hypocrisy over circumcision. Galatians 2. Peter played the hypocrite. Barnabas saw it. He played the hypocrite too. Well, if an apostle can play the hypocrite, surely I can. He was carried away with hypocrisy. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? How does your sin affect others. It does. How? Two. You need to solicit help when you're tempted. You need to ask for help when the tempter comes. The telephone works. A knock on the door works. There is nothing wrong going to a brother or sister and to say, I'm tempted. Pray with me. Help me. Bear my burden. God expects that. God expects it. Seek help when you're tempted. Think about David. As I read the narrative, David had so many opportunities to get help. When he saw that beautiful woman bathing, he inquired of her. He could have said, God's look, I saw this beautiful woman I'm wanting to commit adultery. Boy, I, I, I want to call her to me and sleep with her so bad I can't stand it. Can you help me? When he called for Bathsheba, he could have told the guys, pray with me. I need help. Help me stand firm. Pray with me. And even after he committed adultery, he could have in that letter to Joab said, Joab, my, my, my fleshly pride wants Uriah dead. Don't let me do something foolish. Help me. Help me be strong and to do your will. But he didn't. He went ahead and did what he wanted. Galatians 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. 
we as the people of God have an obligation to help each other. And you know what? You can't help me unless I tell you I need help. And there is nothing wrong with your going to someone and saying, I need help. Allow your brothers and sisters to bear your burden. Seek the help you need. If David had done that, his life, Uriah's life, Bathsheba's life, the nation of Israel would have all been different. You can change the influence your sin has on others by seeking help when you're tempted not sinning in the first place. And third, you need to speak your sin. You need to speak your sin. You see, let me, uh, here's the truth of the matter. Sin loves secrecy. Sin likes to be covered up. Sin does not want to be brought to the light. You bring sin to the light, it loses its power. Jesus said, John 3, 19 and 20. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. Sin likes darkness. When do people commit crime? Typically speaking. You commit a crime in broad daylight, if you wait till it's dark, then people can't see. When you sin, do you want to broadcast on Facebook? Well, well some people do. But do you really want to tell everybody what you've done? No. You want to cover it up. Keep it secret. Sin loves secrecy. But trust me when I tell you, you throw light on sin and it loses its power. Trust me. It does. Bring it to the light. We'll give you the power to resist the wiles of the devil. What if David had committed the adultery? Yeah, you've got some lives that are going to be harmed. You're going to have a baby. You're going to have Bathsheba who has been violated. You're going to have Uriah whose wife's been violated. I, things are going to be topsy-turvy. But the nation of Israel would have been different. Lives would have been different. Uriah would have lived. He had a chance to bring what he had done to the light, but he chose to cover it up and to keep it secret. But David learned a lesson. He learned to bring his sin to the light. He says after his encounter with Nathan, Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said... I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Nathan comes to David, tells him the parable about the sheep. David becomes angry. 
Nathan says, you are the man. You remember what David said? I have sinned. I have sinned. When the prodigal son went home, he said to his father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I have had the experience of people responding to the invitation and say, if I have sinned, well, folks, if you don't know you've sinned, stay in your seat. Seriously. Don't say to God or to brothers and sisters, if I have sinned, either you have or you haven't. I have sinned, David said. The prodigal said, I have sinned. You know, we, we, we like that middle ground. We don't want to bring everything to the light. But there's no other way. When we bring sin to the light, it loses its power. Find someone to whom you can confess your sin. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Confession does so much good. Let me ask you. Do you need to confess sin this morning? Do you maybe need to confess the name of Jesus to be baptized into his death raised to walk a new way of life or is it the case that as a child of God you need to come and you need to confess sin you need to say I have sinned against heaven I've sinned against others and I need the prayers of the church. If you need to come this morning, won't you come right now as we stand singing?